Hello there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I'm going to be talking about assembly codes in Revit. Quite an important thing to understand if you're managing classification systems. So I'm revisiting what I see as some of the essential pillars of Revit. I've done a video in the past on shared parameters, and before this one I would have also released a keynoting uh, video, and now we're covering assembly codes. These are essentially the three pillars of data management in a Revit model, I would say. So assembly codes, um, by the users, for a user. So I've set these up in companies successfully before. So what I show you is gonna be a tried and tested solution um, if you're looking for a way to manage your assembly codes. So what I'm gonna cover is what they actually are. I'm gonna talk about some of the classification systems you might encounter. Then I'm gonna talk about UniClass 2015 and a file that you can use to set up your system very quickly and easily. And then look at the, the structure of an assembly code file, just in case you need to make one for some reason. I'll finally look at just how you can potentially line up and map these tables together if you need to. So what are assembly codes? Well, they're an inherent field or parameter available in most Revit elements. They're intended typically for classification. They behave very similarly to a keynote in terms of a code driving a description from a TXT file. But essentially they really are mostly used just to manage classification. So um, they, can't, they can't generate a keynote legend, so I wouldn't use them for something such as a coding system you want to tag on a drawing. This is, this is why they're better suited to a classification system, because they sit behind the scenes. So you can see here, for example, I have an assembly code driving an assembly description, and these both come with this wall, for example. And in this case, I'm telling it based on, I think, the uni, uh, the uni class system here. Or actually, no, that might, that might be uni format. Yeah, that's uni format. Um, I'm telling it it's a precast wall type. And these are quite useful for um, cost management, construction management, um, general procurement. There's a lot of things people use uh, classification codes for. Uh, one code uh, system that you might have seen in Revit as well is OmniClass, which has its own system embedded into Revit itself. Um, loadable families should all have what we call table 23 available, um, but I've got to be honest, I really, really make use of OmniClass numbers. And the main reason why is that these aren't present in system families, so they're not a holistic solution for classifying all the elements in your model. They really only suit loadable components. So for example, if you were for some reason trying to find an Omniclass classification that suited an element that you had to use an in-place family for, um, or you also had to use a loadable family, you wouldn't be able to assign a code to it as far as I'm aware. So as a result, usually most people look beyond this to something like assembly codes. Uh, one system by default that comes with Revit is the uniformat system. Um, I don't typically use this one anymore, um, even though it is sometimes used on projects I'm on. It really just depends on what the client or the cost manager requests. I find this is slowly being phased out in favor of UniClass 15, um, but you can find more out about the system at the CS CSI website if you're more interested in finding out more about it. The master format system is quite popular in America and Canada. I believe this is the main place that it's being used at the moment. I haven't encountered it on a project myself personally, um, but again, you can find out more about it on CSI where they have all the information about the classification system. I haven't actually used a assembly code file for master format before. I believe one might come with Revit. Um, if not, I'm sure they provide one as well somewhere. But I, I use UniClass 2015 in most of my projects. It's really becoming the emerging standard. Um, again, mainly because it's, it's emerging in the UK, uh, which is really leading the charge on most things related to BIM and the ISOs. So I do find that UniClass 15 is quite important. And it's a very broad system as opposed to other alternatives. Some of them are a little bit too focused on construction and not necessarily focused on operations and life cycle management. Whereas a lot of the classifications in here actually go well beyond construction itself. Um, you can find out more about it at the NBS website, um, which will have a lot of information available there. Um, it's broken into tables. Uh, so each of these tables covers a very particular aspect of classification. Um, some of them are quite abstract. For example, activities um, is quite an abstract application for a classification system. But of course, if you're trying to classify the types of activities that occur within a space, during life cycle management, if you can have a standardized system, well, that's really gonna help facilities management actually run programs in a more predictable manner. As well as this, things like spaces and building type classifications, even complex classifications, obviously something that you wouldn't see in a lot of other classification systems, but obviously you can go all the way down to systems and products, which is more commonly used. And you can even see some, some quite abstract ones there, such as roles and also CAD objects. I know you can classify things like grids, levels, tags, things that most classification systems don't really consider. So it's very thorough. Um, there are a lot of codes in the system, I'll be honest. 
Uh, architects typically will use systems and products and sometimes elements and functions uh, for most of the objects in their models. I think it's from elements and functions, systems and products. It's sort of a granular approach to some degree. As you work your way down these tables, they do become more specific. Um, but you can use multiple classifications on an object if it's relevant. You don't just have to apply a single code. Now in assembly codes, you do. I'm gonna show you a tool that lets you go around that to some degree. Um, it's important to note that some of these tables are very big. For example, the products table has more than 7,000 rows of data. Now, if you're going to go and write an assembly code uh, file from this, obviously you go a little bit crazy, right? It wouldn't be very fun. And there are ways to sort of automate this from their comma separated value files, um, such as passing it through a program like Dynamo and restructuring it into a file that can be turned into an assembly code file. Um, but luckily there's an organization out there that's actually been actively staying on top of doing this for us. So I'd like to thank um, Graham over at Digital Gorilla. He's really helping us stay on top of um, the Uniclass 15 standard. Um, there's a free uh, up-to-date file since I think uh, October currently when I made this video um, that captures all the codes in Uniclass 2015. Pretty amazing. So let's just have a quick look at the Uniclass 2015 file in the context of a model I've set up based on my templating standard. So I'm just gonna open my basic sample project that you can find for free on my website. Um, if I go to 3D and just have a look at maybe one of the elements in this model, uh, for example, this roof, and I go in its type properties, down here you can see I have an assembly code which is driving an assembly description, so it's grayed out. And if I just explore this code, you can see I'm now in the Uniclass 2015 file. I've renamed it just so it's something in within my standard, but this is essentially just the file from Digital Gorilla. I think I've left a little note at the top that thanks them for it. Um, but you can see here the tables in action and the various data trees available. Now you don't have to go right down to the bottom of a tree to classify something. If I want, I can just classify something up at SS Systems. Um, and it's obviously not a logical classification, but you can work at any level of the data tree. So it's a very flexible system, and it means you don't have to over-classify something if you don't need to as well. Um, but where there is a deeper classification available, the system will support that as well. So pretty much what you can do is just make sure that your template and all your content has these uniclass files set up. Um, and in this case, if I go even down to the point of a table, I believe I've even went to that point of every object having a uniclass um, code associated to it. In this case, the assembly code uh, appears to be, yeah, it's a coffee table. So you can see I have also went to the point of assigning an omniclass number in the case of this object. So if I do edit the family, I will see that omniclass field available here, but that's the only place you can access it. So that's why it's restricted to loadable families. So I do find that the uniclass system is far more flexible. And as a result, you can access this data in many formats, obviously Dynamo and apps can access this data. But if I make a multi-category schedule, assembly code and description, um, I can obviously start to see some of those fields populated across, across my model. Um, this allows you to do high level classification takeoffs. In this case, there are some things without classification codes. For example, I have a light that's not classified at the moment. So sometimes it's a good way to sort of audit what's not classified in your model as well. Um, but a lot of the time people use them for procurement and quantity takeoff. It just depends on the application of who's using the model and how they're using it. But a lot of clients will require you to have a classification system established in your model as well um, as part of just your setup. Now, you may not necessarily always be asked to use the same classification system, which can cause some challenges. But there are ways that I'll show you where you might be able to map some data between them anyway. That's how I sort of implement them in at least my template and my setup. Um, and obviously everything in my library has already been pre-classified in most cases, um, which obviously took a lot of time, but once you've done it once, it's there. It's important to note that the structure of an assembly codes file is very particular. Um, so it's very similar to a Keynote file structure, if you might've seen my video on that, but there are some key differences. So you have a code, a tab, a description that's associated back to that code, another tab, and then a unique number, which tells it where it belongs in the tree. Now, essentially this is a, uh, a tree in order. So you can't have a tree branch that falls before another one. You have to do it in order of hierarchy. So you can see that at the start of this, this file here, for example, I'm starting at one, then I'm going to two, which implies that this is a branch of the previous group. After that, there's a three which implies that is also a branch of that group, then a four, so another branch again. But the next one is three, which means go back one level and associate that to the second branch. 
So the sequence that these occur in is very important to how the tree stacks. Keynote files are a bit different in that you don't have to have anything in a predictable order. In the case of an assembly code file, it's all based on order. So it's very important that it's written in a particular way. As well as this, um, typically I believe you do need a tab at the very least after this in order to support the structure of an assembly codes file. So I can try and make one very quickly just as a sample um, and hopefully it'll work. We'll see, see how I go. Um, sometimes I find that live demos will cause problems, uh, but let's see what I can do. So I'm just gonna delete everything in this file. Let's just call this um, class, class one, subclass one, sub subclass one. So we're creating like a, a tree hierarchy here. And let's just call this subclass two. Um, so I might actually give these codes as well. So I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna call this uh, one. I'm gonna call this one underscore one, one underscore one underscore one. So I'm naming them based on an order as well. And one underscore two. And I might just add an extra subclass under here. And in this case, this will be one, two, one. So I'm sort of implying a tree structure from the get-go. But now I need to imply which branch order we have. So we start with a branch hierarchy of one, then a branch hierarchy of two, then three. But now we're going back to the next subclass. So we're going two, then three. I believe we're gonna need tabs on the end of all of these as well. So what I like to do usually is just put something like a something called replace and just make sure there's no dead data in these columns. Then I'm gonna save this as a tab delimited file and I'm gonna replace all those replaces with nothing essentially. So I'm gonna get that last tab that I require for the structure of the file. So I'll just save this and I'll call this um, testing and I'll have to change the format to a tab delimited file. I believe this should work. I'm then gonna open this file in notepad. So I'm just gonna open that file. I'm not gonna save this email. <laughs> I'm just gonna open testing. And in this case, I do have these replaces. So I'm just gonna select one and go control H for find and replace and just replace them with nothing. This should leave a tab on the end of each row and I'll just save this, close it. And I believe I should be able to repath. So assembly files are repathed under manage additional settings, assembly code. I'm gonna browse and I'm gonna go from my personal assembly code location down to my desktop file. There we go, it's reloaded successfully. If I view this file, we can see I have my class, then my two subclasses, and then my sub subclasses. So you can see how these elements start relating back, in this case, to the hierarchy of a tree. So it's quite unique to assembly codes, but it's very relevant to how assembly code files are typically ordered and how classification systems are ordered as a result as well. Actually, other way around. <laughs> it's relevant to classification systems and how we order assembly code files as a result. Don't want the dog to leave the tail there. Okay, so um, so that's pretty much how you can create your own, but I'd recommend against it if something's available already for a system that your client requests or one that you can suggest to your client. And in absence of a request, I would recommend UniClass 2015. There's also the Classification Manager. This is an app that comes with Revit, I believe from version 2018 or 2017 onwards, um, which allows you to populate from a pre-built file um, built into the app. And I believe this is being kept up to date as a database, I think. Um, so might be worth just double checking um, if it's a live source, uh, because obviously the, these tables do get updated from time to time. I believe that the app is being updated progressively and maybe that's how they're capturing the changes. I find this is quite a slow process to establish a classification system. But if you don't know how a classification system works with assembly codes, this could be a good alternative. I'll show you really quickly how it works. So I've already got assembly code set up in this file. Um, so let's pick this cladding, this wall cladding. I'm gonna go up to BIM Oper interoperability tools and there's a lot of things you can use this for as well, such as Kobe checking and model checking as well. Um, in this case, I'm probably not gonna to touch on those because they're not really my strong suit. Um, hopefully in the future, I'll be able to show you more on those. But let's just go to here to assign a classification. At the moment, I'm just using the UniClass 2015 database, but notice that we do have other ones like OmniClass, UniFormat and Master Format, even IFC classification systems. But in this case, I'm just gonna work with the UniClass 2015 database. So I'm gonna say finish. And essentially at the moment, it's gonna to respond to whatever I currently have selected in my model. And it's gonna give me some options for classifying those elements. So we can see at this level, 
we have facility level classification. So if I select nothing, I'm classifying my project essentially. Um, if I select this wall, notice I'm now activating my EF product and SS table. So systems, products, and uh, I think elements. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what the classifications represented. Um, EF, whatever that is. <laughs> I never really use that classification to be honest. Um, if I go to floor plan and I select one of my rooms, I believe I should get some classifications relevant there, like the space classifications. I can see here's my here's my space classifications. I think um I think the EF maybe it's elements. Um, whoop, just double check. Mm, it's definitely whatever hierarchy is sitting higher than pro access for sure. So um in this case, note that at the moment I already have class uh, assembly codes operating in my model. But notice that already, once I've started working this way, I've got these shared parameters that have been added to my model. I've got the SS, EF, and PR numbers, and I've got the descriptions as well. So what I can do now is say, well, this is a wall, and I'm going to classify it as a system. It's a wall and barrier system, and it's going to be a unit wall structure, maybe. Hmm. I'll have a look at what options are available to me, because it does take a while. You know what, actually, I'll just search for it. I'm looking for a cladding system. So I'm just gonna search for cladding. Now it's a little bit slow. It's, it's searching through a lot of codes. Um, so I have a few options here and you can see that the more numbers that are involved, the more detailed the system becomes. I can just say it's part of wall cladding systems. Maybe I can say it's a composite wall cladding. Um, in this case, it's probably a board cladding system instead because it's sort of just like a, a weatherboard system. Um, so in this case, I'll just assign. And the moment that I do that under the type properties, you can see that it's pushed through these values. Now I can actually see in here, I actually misclassified my assembly code before. I made it the wall tile. So I must've copied a tile wall and just went with it. So I can actually just copy that in. And now I'm up to date here as well. Now, one thing I don't really like about the way this system works is that these two codes aren't live connected like an assembly codes file. So you, that you can't rely on just one thing driving the other. So you can end up with discrepancy of information. It almost makes this a bit of a waste of information, to be honest. We really just care about that code because you're probably going to send that out to a database anyway, where they only need one piece of information really to drive the other one. So there is a little bit of an element of risk in there if you don't carefully maintain uh, these, these data fields once they're in there. As well as this, you can obviously apply different types of classifications, unlike an assembly code system. So you can support multiple class classifications on one element at a time. And to be honest, even if you don't use this app, as long as you have these shared parameters and you're using an assembly code file, you can push these values across using something like Dynamo quite easily. So it's up to you how you want to work. Um, personally, I just work with these and I tend to just push them across um, when I need to into the parameters if someone needs to use them specifically. Um, but there's probably a few more things the classification manager does do. So I do recommend checking it out um, if you're interested and do just understand that it is going to be adding uh, some parameters to your projects um, that will relate to classification. Now these are technically shared parameters, so you can also export them to your own shared parameters file so you have them available. But the classification manager creates them every time anyway with a consistent GUID. So that's pretty much the classification manager. Um, up to you whether you use it or how which process works best for you or whether you use a bit of both. Um, you can use a table in order to line up two classification systems. So that if a client says, oh, we're switching over from uniclass to master format, well, maybe you have the magic button that says, turn all my uniclass codes into master format codes. But the key to this is you have to have some sort of data source that can line these two up. For example, if I'm looking at a masonry wall, I'd need to know what the code is between the two classification systems because they're not identical to each other. The same data doesn't occur at the same row and it's not always as inherently classified as you might want it to be. For example, typically in a uni class, you can get much more granular with the way that an object is classified. In uni format or master format, it's a little bit more general. And sometimes there are some sub classifications that maybe don't line up perfectly between the tables. For example, you can specify a brick cavity wall in, in uh, uh, uni format, but I think in uni class, you can't necessarily go right down to the construction method. Um, maybe incorrect, it might be under products or systems, but I don't believe I could find it. Um, but as long as you have something where it can detect the code, say there's that code, go to Excel, check where the match is, and then repopulate that match, you can essentially switch between them, and then you can just switch your assembly code file, and voila, you're working with another classification system. Now it's obviously, you know, there's a bit of manual work in setting up those mapping tables, and personally I'm not aware of someone that's released a mapping table for multiple systems, but this is the sort of thing with a few hours of work and 
uh, an understanding of the common classifications you use in your company, it would be more than possible in my opinion. So just some final recommendations based on what I've sort of shown you about assembly coding and classifications. Uh, make sure that you have at least one system deployed in your company. That way you can set up a mapping system when you have time or if, if the need arises. If you know that you're complying to Uniclass 2015, for example, you can confidently at least tell a client uh, if they ask for a classification system that we use this classification system and your cost manager might not have a preference. They might be able to work with that specific system. It really depends. It also depends on other consultants and how they classify their elements as well. For example, if your structural engineer does master format and you did Uniclass 2015, obviously one of you is gonna to have to give in to the other one and do a bit of work. As well as that, it's just good to check with your cost managers what they actually want to use or your project managers, if they have a preference, if they even know what BIM is. I mean, obviously there's various levels of BIM maturity and the less mature they are, the less they're gonna care about the classification system, but I think it's worth asking them. As well as that, try to stay up to date. So if you are responsible for the codes and the standards in your office, I think that part of your responsibility should be to be aware of what classification systems are out there and what to expect on projects or what to tell people they should be briefing on projects. I think it's your obligation as a BIM manager or a BIM professional to do this. And of course, to all the BIM managers out there, keep a backup or two for your assembly code file. Um, things like to go missing and things like to go wrong, especially in these sensitive files where the structure is very important. <laughs> But hopefully you've enjoyed this and a few of the other system-based videos I've made um, recently and hopefully they help some BIM managers and BIM professionals out there better manage their models. If you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks, take care, bye.